Why do men compete for women? The simple, proximate, and mundane answer to this question is because men are trying to get sexual access to women. A more profound explanation is provided by a theory called parental investment. Parental investment theory states that the sex that invests the most in offspring will be the choosier sex when it comes to selecting a sexual partner. In most animals, females contribute substantially more to their offspring than males, and therefore females in general get to be choosier when selecting a mate. As a result, males are left to compete with each other to gain sexual access to reproductively viable females. But how did scientists discover parental investment as the answer to why men compete for women? The answer has to do with the different physical and behavioral characteristics that we see between the sexes. Charles Darwin offered an explanation for why males look different than females when he published his work on sexual selection in 1871 in the book The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. Here, Darwin was trying to answer why males have more elaborate traits that are also known as ornaments than females, even though both sexes have to solve similar environmental problems such as eating, survival, fighting off predators, and combating diseases. For example, how can male ornaments that reduce the chances of survival, such as the peacock's tail or the bright coloration seen in many male species or the deeper voices found in human males evolve? These traits seem to be more of a handicap than traits that can aid in survival. It's a lot simpler to explain traits that derive from natural selection since such traits help organisms survive in nature. A carnivorous mammal such as a male or female tiger has claws. In these animals, claws are useful for catching and holding onto prey. But other traits such as the long and elaborate tails found in peacocks are heavy, they are metabolically costly, and clunky, making it more difficult to escape predators. Similarly, bright coloration or the louder, deeper voices in human males can make them more conspicuous to predators. Such elaborate characteristics are costly to produce, yet traits like this exist throughout nature. Darwin suggested that costly traits might evolve if they increase the chances of survival and reproduction even if these traits ultimately cause the survival of the organism. Traits that help an organism survive in nature are obviously important, but surviving is not enough. In order for life to continue, organisms also need to reproduce. In Darwin's view, there could be two reasons why elaborate traits, which include behavioral traits, could have evolved. Either they evolved because they were useful to one sex, usually males, because they helped them fight off competitors, or because certain traits were simply preferred by females. The horns found in rams, or the antlers found in many species of deer, either gave males an advantage when competing with other males for sexual access to females, or these traits simply gave males an advantage to be chosen as sexual partners by females. The second explanation was more problematic for Darwin. Okay, fine, females prefer elaborate traits such as taller human males with more symmetrical faces. But preferring certain traits simply because females found them to be sexy doesn't answer why females were interested in those traits in the first place. Plus, this explanation assumes that there are no direct benefits for why females prefer certain traits over others. The everlasting struggle of who will mate and breed with whom is the most logical explanation of why elaborate apparatuses like the huge antlers seen in many ungulates or the increased size of human males exists. But this is as far as Darwin was able to explain before his theory of sexual selection came to an end and went dormant for about 100 years after it was first published. The major reason why sexual selection or the idea of female choice was ignored is because the non-theological idea of females of any species having any kind of choice was not an acceptable explanation by Victorian England's Puritan culture. The idea that females had any kind of power, especially among the so-called stupid animals, was laughed at and unthinkable at that time. Plus, according to Victorian scholars, women weren't even supposed to be interested in sex in the first place. But, 
1972, the most important new insight that further explained sexual selection came from the great and pioneering evolutionary theorist Robert Trivers. Trivers published a pivotal paper called Parental Investment and Sexual Selection, pointing out that the reason why sex differences exist in many species is due to the amount of effort that each sex expends in offspring. This theory is called parental investment theory. More specifically, parental investment theory states that the sex that invest the most energy and time in offspring will be the choosier sex. Individuals that put more effort in caring for an offspring will be choosier when it comes to selecting a sexual partner. Conversely, the sex that invest the least in offspring will compete and fight among themselves for the privilege of breeding with an individual of the opposite sex. Even though there are a couple of other contributing factors that can affect how choosy a female can be, such as having more males than females in a given population, the parental investment rule holds true whether individuals happen to be male or female. Seahorses and sea dragons, for example, have a unique mode of reproduction. The males in this species provide most of the parental care, which includes getting pregnant and bearing their young. Male seahorses have sperm, but they also have a pouch that they use to carry approximately 1,500 eggs that they receive from a female. Their gestation period can last up to 45 days depending on the species, and during this time, they provide prolactin and oxygen and keep the eggs safe until the young are fully formed. At the end of their gestation period, they will experience strong muscular contractions that can last up to 12 hours. Eventually, the contractions will eject the baby seahorses into the surrounding water. And finally, after giving birth, they will be ready to take on the responsibility once again. Since male seahorses provide most of the parental care, they are very choosy with whom they decide to mate with. Here, the female seahorses are the ones that compete with each other for the privilege of transferring their mature eggs into a male seahorse. The females are bigger and they fight and compete for males. They fight over territory, food, and for the attention of a potential mate. They also engage in courtship by dancing, by changing color, or mirroring a male's movement. The fact that males among seahorses are the ones that get pregnant and provide most of the parental care is the exact reason why we see a reversal in mating behavior. It's crucial that they choose a high quality mate since the survival of the offspring is highly dependent on it. Even though parental investment can be performed by both sexes throughout the animal kingdom, females in general incur the higher cost for reproduction. In humans, some men do invest heavily in children and adopt a long-term mating strategy where they get married, and these men tend to be choosier when selecting a partner than men that primarily seek one-night stands. But even though there are men that invest heavily in children, women still incur a higher cost for reproduction. A human female, for example, will begin her life with a limited number of gametes, she is born with a few hundred unreplenishable eggs. This is all she will ever have. She will lose one or two eggs during every ovulation period or menstrual cycle, but many more eggs will simply die. This means that women are limited in the total number of children that they are able to have in their lifetime. Male sperm production, on the other hand, is being produced continuously throughout their life. On average, men produce approximately 12 million sperm cells per hour. In short, sperm is cheap and readily available. Technically, this allows men the capacity of producing thousands of offspring so long as they can fight off competitors, attract women, and withstand sexual exhaustion. On average, most women living in traditional societies will have no more than about five infants in their life. But just having one offspring is already a huge investment for her. She will provide a nutrient-rich egg, and when fertilized, she will carry and provide vital nutrients to the embryo for nine months. Then she will risk her life by giving birth, and if she and her offspring survive, she will breastfeed her child for two to four years. During this time, she will not be able to reproduce again until weaning has fully concluded. Pregnancy is a threatening time for women, especially in traditional societies. 
Ancestral women that chose a male with poor genes or a male that offered no help experienced a lower reproductive success and their children didn't survive to reproduce. So throughout evolutionary time, there has been a strong evolutionary selection pressure for women to act extremely cautious and discriminative when choosing a sexual partner. Conversely, since the reproductive payoff is very high for the amount of effort that is required to reproduce for men, biologically speaking, it makes sense to try and impregnate as many women as possible. They can make many copies of themselves with very little effort. But of course there's a catch. In order to successfully reproduce, men have the burden of having to expend more mating effort than women. Men must compete with other men for the attention and the sexual access to reproductively viable women. Men are aggressive, dangerous, clever, and they compete in a myriad of ways while women are not easy to impress. With this said, it's probably a good moment to point out that there are many tendencies encoded in our DNA that evolved because these tendencies allowed our ancestors to solve specific problems in the evolutionary past. Individuals that had the tendency of being competitive, for example, lived to sire more offspring than individuals that didn't have this competitive nature. We're not always aware of the many predispositions that we possess. Men aren't always conscious about why they feel the inclination to gain power, control, or positions of higher status in society, just like how some species of male birds don't understand why they have the desire to build beautiful, elaborate nests. They're trying to impress females. Humans are descendants of individuals that behave in these particular ways because these behaviors work. We might not be aware of these predispositions, but they are certainly influencing our behaviors every day. I'm not saying that we are puppets to our genes, but rather that our DNA interacts with culture, and culture sculpts our behavior in innumerable ways, such as how some men compete through violence and aggression while other men compete by being nice and loyal to a female partner. To sum things up, Travers's work brought the idea of female choice back into the forefront of sexual selection. Sexual selection with parental investment theory has now become a major part of modern evolutionary biology and behavioral ecology. Many studies have followed since the inception of Travers's parental investment theory and these studies have shown that Darwin was correct. Males compete with each other for sexual access to females, but ultimately females choose who they want to mate with. But studies have also pointed out what Darwin got wrong. Contrary to what Darwin thought, females do have a reason as to why they find some elaborate characteristics more desirable than others. It's not because they find a particular trait to be pretty for no apparent reason. Women don't find tall men attractive simply because they look better. In general, they do find tall men sexy. But the underlying reason why they like taller men is because on average, they are more successful than shorter men. This is not to say that short men cannot be successful, but on average, taller men are more successful than shorter men. In modern societies, taller men earn more money and hold higher positions of power. A man that is good at extracting resources from the environment is a desirable man. Of course, women are not judging a potential mate through only one single trait. Women assess and weigh out many different traits in one potential mate. Who cares if a tall man earns a lot of money if he's stingy? Many studies performed on female behavior in various species have concluded that females are able to detect the slightest differences in traits among available mates. Females prefer physical characteristics that correspond with health, vigor, and that are associated with surviving well in the environment. And these traits are very specific and cannot be faked such as having a good facial and body symmetry, having a large body size, or owning a car like a Rolls Royce. Men can't simply grow to be six feet tall if they aren't already, or a man can't simply go purchase a Bugatti to signal to a woman that he has plenty of resources and therefore is capable of taking care of her and her offspring. Since men can't fake honest traits, many men engage in ill tactics to secure a mate when they can. But the reality of the situation is that in general, most men do not have desirable traits. 
In nature, the competition is feral, and as a result, a few males end up siring many offspring while many males fail to reproduce.